you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we will be looking at the demon basics, what you need to know to survive in this world of darkness, as well as a very brief overview of the houses, factions, and Earthbound. At last, another lamb joins the flock, a lost soul looking to find the true meaning of happiness through cathartic enlightenment, to find their true salvation. This is what I would say if I was speaking to anyone else bar you. You needn't look so confused. I know why you are here. You suspect me to be something totally profound. I also know you are a vampire, an oxymoron of existence, a descendant of the first murderer. Now, you needn't look so surprised. I left the breadcrumbs for you to find me. If you were anyone else, I would have killed you when I first learned of your allegiance to the Phoenix Institute. Their particular methods of dealing with the restless dead is offensive. I sensed your presence, the, the taint that is within, and watched your motives. You are not very good at hiding your tracks, you know. I know who you are, who your family are, and that powerful Nosferatu that fears and loathes the fallen. I should kill and devour the bug that winningly ensnared itself into my web, my club, Detonation Boulevard, but an opportunity presents itself, doesn't it? Little lamb, you wish to learn about my ilk, and I require a pawn to help me navigate through this blackened night. Well, the contract is sealed. Your soul, or whatever is left of it, belongs to me, and I am sure your master will be thrilled with the new friend you made. The descriptor of oneself wasn't just to flex my poetic prowess, Yona, you know, with decayed petals of romantic goth within, but a true descriptor. What you refer to as a demon, most of my ilk would refer to as a fallen or damned if they are feeling particularly miserable about their existence. We fell from heaven for siding with Lucifer at the dawn of creation, rather than God and his messengers and attendants, the Elohim, the angels, as you would call them. We are damned for we were cast into the abyss for our treachery by Michael, the voice of God, the seraph of the flaming sword, the most loyal of the Elohim. The Abyss is where most demons are found. I know you are aware of the Abyss that is more than just hell, the swirling torment buried beneath the underworld. I know that the human doctor made you take note, so go ahead and add to them. The Abyss is not the typical depiction of fiery, torturous places for mortal sinners that you so gleefully fetishize. Only the fallen reside there, as mortals do not end up in that realm. It is a desolate and bleak place, devoid of features, and, well, anything else, only with faint echoes of human suffering permeating the space. There we were bodily spirits that can just about touch and speak to our neighbours, but we don't know who or what we were engaging with, per se. We could barely see ourselves. We were left to rot, festering on our own regrets, despair and impotent fury, and the machinations and manipulations of the infernal rulers, who are nothing but insane, and their mind games, since the fallen can't hurt or destroy each other. But we are not free, per se. It is only through a great maelstrom, a powerful underworld storm, that allowed some of us, weaker for them, to break on through to the other side. <clears throat> Sorry. Other more powerful demons existed on your plane, much longer than you and I, corrupt beings called Earthbound, but I will save that for a different time. What we both have in common, that is the Earthbound and the Fallen, is that we are never truly free from the law of the Abyss. We feel the pull, so we have to find something to anchor us here, and by something, I mean someone. We inhabit the soulless bodies of those who, in life, resonated with natures akin to our own. Zachariah Zimri is not my name or some crude manifestation of my power or my love for alliteration. Zacharias Zimri is the mortal name. We have two more. The Fallen have a true name which is a reflection of our complete identity which to you is a collection of arcane symbols and sounds and concepts that don't need to be spelled out. The other is our celestial name which demons may use when conversing with each other. Some fallen go so far as to shed their mortal name when they gain enough power and memory to re-establish their fallen identity. 
You do not get to learn that privilege of mine tonight. Names have power, and you do not have that luxury over me, little lamb. Rare is it to be pushed out, but I have heard of it happening to some comrades of mine. Our minds and emotions become entangled with the possessed as we take over the individual. This has the benefit of shielding us from the full memory of our torment in hell, but we are often hindered by the memories and feelings the mortal soul left behind. As such, it is impossible for us to possess multiple parties at once. I should highlight these benefits are side effects that help us to adjust and blend into the loud, busy world. Our salvation comes at the expense of someone else. We are drawn to those whose will, spirit, souls, whatever you wish to call them, have been eroded by despair, anger, addiction, anything really that has caused the mortal to lose that spark of humanity. When we find this hole, we force our way in. The nearly deceased and mentally ill qualified too, in case you were wondering. There are also some who have spoon-fed enough information to summon a demon and act as a willing vessel, which makes the acclimatization in a sense to greater power quicker and easier. The mortal shell is usually weaker and does not generate power from it alone. We require food and drink and occasional sleep, but we are more than flesh suits, you know. We rely on the faith of mortals. This isn't a belief in demons, angels, or anything you digested in some philosophy class, nor do I speak of this true faith that a few select devote can wield to harm and stun both you and I. Faith in this instance is a divine spark that is a part of you that surrenders itself to an idea or a dream and makes it real. Before the aforementioned rebellion, all Elohim received their faith in the Big G God, but once the rebels were cast out, they could no longer access that source. However, the divine spark has been granted to the pinnacle of creation, humanity. Faith is so strong and it's so hard to come by now, I know, fucking huge shock at that, so it is something we nurture from those mortals that know rather than tear it out of a total stranger. There are a few ways we fall and can reap faith. Humans can be faced with either great kindness or terrible cruelty, and the fallen have the ability to extract small amounts of faith from people's souls. Some may worship us, but this is privy to the earthbound who lack the humanity to do as we do. Right, so we may form pacts, right, with certain mortals to acquire faith each morning. This is a special arrangement. The individual in question is approached by the fallen who presents them with one or more supernatural abilities. These may include the healing of an illness, enhanced understanding, the world's enigmas, or the acquisition of wealth and charm, and all within the limits of the relevant fallen's power. We cannot perform the sort of miracles that would make the weak world hot under the collar, is what I'm trying to say. Well, not anymore, anyway. Anyway, the acclamation of faith may be gradual but valuable if the fools are dispersed worldwide, as they offer their faith at every personal sunrise. Optionally, one can provide donations or use the faith to bolster the thrall's capabilities, transferring them into a more affected agent, capable of forming additional packs to gain more strength. The exact wording of our packs are often deceiving to the thrall. On the opposite side is torment, which accumulates through sinful acts, which doesn't need to be specified, I'm sure. It is reduced by writing said wrongs and not behaving like a callous cunt, but it is not always as easy as that, as I'm sure you are more than aware of, K Knight. We have always had it, but it increased a thousandfold when the two greatest things we loved, God and humanity, rejected and banished us to the abyss. Torment, in this sense, is our strength of the bond with hell, compared to the bond of our former selves. Torment is the mindless hate and rage that the damned have possessed since the fall into hell. Too much turns us to the earthbound, or turns us into earthbound, I should say, or banish us straight to hell. The balance we have with oneself reflects the appearance of our apocalyptic form or revelatory form or visage if we wish to be a bit more subtle with it. We were once able to take on whatever form we wish to fit in the scenario at hand for the faith that the early humans would feel it so, but since the Age of Wrath, the thousand or something year war between the Heaven and the Fallen, our limitations have only allowed us to shift to what can be best described as a reflection of our true nature, with its capability shifting depending on our primary law, which are the remnants of the divine abilities that demons possessed as Elohim. These depend on our house, which I will elaborate shortly, so 
patient. Depending on one's torment, this form is, to put it crudely for you to understand, demonic or angelic in appearance. Mortals are left in awe or catatonic fear, depending on the form. This is referred to as a revelation, which is another way we can accumulate faith. From my understanding, it is similar to what happens when a human sees a ghost or garou. Yes, I know bits about them too. The nature of our law is dependent on that too. Unlike those, we are immune to mind control of any nature, whether you attempt to make me do something without my consent or manipulate my emotions, two key favourite party tricks to the canine. Similar illusionary mind tricks do not trick us so easily, so keep your illusions to yourself. We are also aware of supernatural activity, hence my learning of your presence with the ghost hunters. As touched upon earlier, we cannot be possessed, but it is possible for us to be ejected or fight a separate soul to seize control of a vessel. In our apocalyptic forms, damage that most would describe as lethal can be soaked with our enhanced stamina, and we can use our collected faith to heal those sort of wounds or weaker. We know who or what speaks our celestial and true names, regardless of how far away they are or whether they exist in the skin or shadowlands. This can be used for communication amongst other damned and our thralls, though it is much easier to establish a link with the latter than the former. The difference is the concentration and faith we have to expel, regardless of house. A house is not like your vampiric clan or werewolf tribe, and certainly not like a wraith guild. It is bigger and more profound, fulfilling the holes of God's agonizing loneliness. Picture this, the House of the Fallen determines our previous role in heaven before signing of Lucifer's rebellion and our connection with specific laws. The seven stages of creation gave rise to the seven celestial houses of angels, each with its own mandate to oversee a particular aspect of the universe. Got it? Good. The houses of heaven were under the supervision of an autarch or angel overseer before the fall. The angels in each house had a hierarchical order, with no changes in their rank. They all fulfilled their duties as expected by the creator, and found a joy in serving the universe with the abilities and devotion. There are seven of them, or sebatu, in total. They are the Namaru. The first house, otherwise known as Devils, were once the flag bearers of God and bringer of his word. Yes, Lucifer was one of those too. The Asheru, the second house, are the Scourges, who once watched over humanity like their own children. The Anaki, the third house, otherwise known today as the Melithactors, created the world and the tools for those upon it to use. The Nebiru, the fourth house, are the fiends who set the universe running like clockwork and could read its movements like no other. Really like no other. The Lamasu, the fifth house, whose job was to inspire humanity to the heights of pure truth. It would not surprise you to learn that they are known as the Defilers now. The Ravasu, the Sixth House, or the Devourers, were created and oversaw the plants and animals that were to serve under humans. And finally, you have the Seventh House, the Halaku, who destroyed when what was created by the other houses, which was out of time and use. Their alternate name are the Slayers. Since our return to Earth, we adopt different motives in spite of the human lord, which we can talk about at a different time in fuller detail. To provide further direction, we created new divisions and purposes to dedicate ourselves in the modern era. These take the form of factions. There are five of them, and they are the Faustians, who seek to enslave and use humanity to overthrow heaven, the Cryptics, who want to unravel the puzzles to the motives of God and possibly the existence of it itself. The Luciferians, who, to the surprise of fucking no one, look for the missing Lucifer and hope he will again lead them in the war against heaven. The Raveners, who want to end existence in the most violent manner possible, and the Reconcilers, who hope to be forgiven, rejoin heaven and restore Oath to where it was before the fall happened. I'm not sure you are going to fully grasp the extent of my age and existence. I was there, during the beginning. God was, and still is, an infinite. Existed with them is the void, which I know you know plenty about since because of your, you know, the whole ghostly discussion thing. We were created to fill everything in between with the known universe and establish balance and the barriers between via the establishment of the houses. The cosmos we designed was in balance. Commanded by the Maker, we created life. You are the result of that spark. Your shape is not in his image, but your soul to create life is to demonstrate a small essence of the power of God through us. 
humans were our highest, finest and ultimate creation at the time. I question this a lot, but I fundamentally do not create that decision. But I digress. The Maker, God gave us two commands. Firstly, we were to love you all as we did him, which is both pointless as it was petty. The second was not so simple to uphold. We were to remove ourselves from you, humans, and provide no contact or make humans aware of our existence. We would become little more than cogs in the wheel with God claiming all the fucking glory. When we would later be cast into the abyss, we were not exiled but excreted. Humanity in that precious Garden of Eden was blind to the splendours we gave them, though the Holy Book would refer to them as innocent. We would show them the splendours of art and music to the best we could, but our children were just unhappy. No, 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 no not unhappy. Incomplete. Something needed to be done to fulfil them, which would in turn make them feel truly happy, you see the logic here, rather than exert occasional physical reaction of joy that you might find from an advanced animal, which is, or be frank, you were. God provided no answers, and those who challenged the stagnation, for lack of a better word, were never heard from again. Tensions would build and the war in heaven would start with the visions of the Aramel angel of the fourth house. There was a vision that foretold a tragedy for humanity which some believed was either directly caused or allowed by God. The angels, we, well we all debated really whether we should intervene to prevent the disaster, but many were hesitant as they feared their actions might actually cause it. Surely God would not allow such a thing to happen. Aramel was cast out by his house, meaning he would have to rely on his acquaintances for aid. There was much debating, like a fucking lot of debating amongst the Elohim about this. Eventually, the angel Lucifer, the morning star, made the bold decision to lead a rebellion against God and his most loyal of Elohim. Certain angels revealed themselves to humanity. You are aware one of those instances, little lamb, I'm sure. Oh, for fuck's sake, it involves Adam and Eve, and I do just mean the temptation of Eve to eat the fruit, though I'm aware of some who protest it was Lilith. No, what I mean is various Elohim teaching God's children, Adam and Eve, the concept of time, love, charity, and the will to think. We do not teach them the concept of good and evil, it was something they would learn themselves. You see, what we actually gave you was consciousness. We birthed thinkers artists, philosophers and builders who composed wonders, a perfect outcome for a perfect world. Then the night of a thousand years passed and the sun would rise with Michael, who had replaced Lucifer's position, accompanied by his elite challenged Lucifer to return to paradise to become into nothing, heed God's final command. Of course, we denied it. I will not lecture you on a thousand years of conflict because quite frankly, it's still pretty traumatic. I do not feel you are ready for that conversation, little lamb, all the same, so allow me to give you the shortened version. One third of the angels sided with Lucifer and tried to prepare humanity for the impending catastrophe by accelerating its development. The fallen came to humanity to bestow knowledge and awareness, which angered God as he had not intended humans to have such understanding yet. Adam and Eve, the first humans, were gifted but could not use their abilities due to their innocence. Their only concern was surviving and possessing basic knowledge, you could say. The war that ensured saw the fallen learn how to kill through Cain's sin, causing many to become corrupted and wicked. As a consequence of defying the Creator's desires, the fallen, me and everyone else, were expelled from heaven, causing destruction to creation. The fallen engaged in an extended and progressively horrific conflict with the loyal Elohim ultimately losing when the Babel project failed and disconnected them, us, from humanity. The vanquished Elohim were banished into the abyss, myself included, where they remained for countless years and ages. In the end, Eremo's vision was true. By abandoning God and misleading humanity, the rebel Elohim caused it to become a shade of what it was meant to be. Huzzah! You know, it must be hard for you to process demons not as ravaging monsters hell-bent on lust, murder and other forms of wicked tyrannical sin. The good book says all this and more with various examples about how and why we were cast into the abyss. If only God was aware what his precious fallen were up to now. History is written by the victors and the world over has painted their images of us, but we were not defeated. Most of us still love humanity and wish to help, others just wish to spite God. Others, like myself, wish to guide the process of death once again so that it inflicts less harm. We have our stories to tell, and someday, somehow, 
our voices will be heard. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, and you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.